Hello everyone, my name is Dave Landry. Tonight we're going to talk about how to pick the best and leave the rest. An introduction to stock selection. Although it's just an introduction, I have a ton of material to cover. And if you've been to my webinars before, you know that I like to give a lot of uh, takeaways. And, and I just have a ton of things to talk about uh, tonight. Uh, obviously, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, especially after a long holiday weekend. So I know that's not easy. So I'm flattered and honored that uh, that you are here. So thank you so much. Okay, there's a disclaimer screen. Um, you can read it if you like, or you can go to my website and read it. Um, basically, it says that uh, you can lose money trading. And if you've been trading for... For more than a day or two, you probably know that. And what I like to say is just sum it up is all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, what I did my – when I, or wrote, I should say, when I writ, wrote my uh, first book, and there was a few patterns I discovered soon thereafter in all the research, which uh, prompted my second book. And then I realized one of the things that was missing – in these books is how to pick the best stocks. So I went out and I said, okay, here's some stocks that I traded and here's some other ones that look pretty good. And here's the patterns and go out and find stocks that look like this. But I really didn't spend a whole lot of time going through all the details. So it's as the years went by, I realized that that was sort of the missing piece is the actual stock selection. Now, money management has been referred to as the Holy Grail. It's kind of funny. It's like whenever I have a, a a webinar or a seminar or a speech or whatever. My wife's like, what are you talking about? Not the Holy Grail, huh? And I'm like, well, yeah, maybe I'll mention it. Uh, but it's such a great uh, concept to think about. And money management is really vitally important. It's very important to risk just a small amount on any given trade, but obviously you want to be consistent. So you always have the same position size from a risk standpoint. So you participate in the big moves and you don't get too hurt, uh, too bad when you get stopped out. So it's vitally important. And as I often preach, money management can cure a multitude of sins. But your best defense is really a good offense. And I'm going to explore that in a little bit more detail in just one second. But just keep that thought in mind. Now, if you're getting stopped out a lot, you have two problems. Either your stops are too tight or you need to become a better stock picker. Or maybe a combination thereof. Now, if you've if you've uh, been to my weekly chart webinars, you know I tell this story over and over. To, so, to those who are regulars to the weekly charts, uh, my apologies for telling the story yet again. But I've, I've actually had two cases that I remember where I've, I've received phone calls and emails from people where they've gotten stopped out like 20 times in a row. One guy was 21 times, and one guy was 19 times in a row. So, roughly 20 times in a row. And obviously, they were pretty distraught and pretty bummed out and, and really questioning trading. Well, they're doing two things wrong. Number one, their stops are probably too tight, and that's an easy fix. And I fixed a lot of people just by telling them, hey, just loosen up your stops. You're going to catch more and more trends. Obviously, you want to compensate for the added risk by reducing your share size down a little bit to get that consistent percent risk per trade down. But the other thing that you really need to question and you really need to do is do you need to reevaluate your stock picking? And it's difficult as a trader because trading is an active verb. And we might be entering a phase in the market right now where there isn't anything to do. In fact, for my trading service for today, I recommended that we don't take any new action. If I'm not going to take any new action, I don't think you should take any new action. So sometimes – you do have to sit on your hands a little bit and wait for the best opportunities and, and not try to force something to happen. This could be a little counterintuitive for people who are successful in, in other businesses because you have to take action in other businesses. But sometimes in trading, your best action is no action. So I kind of got to thinking as I was putting my slides together, and I added this slide in last minute. And I think it's just such a wonderful – explanation of what it takes to become a trader you again like I said a second ago some people say that uh, the holy grail of the trading is money and position, position management and it's incredibly important 
Don't get me wrong, okay? And this is why I'll probably do a, a, a seminar or a course just on this. And I definitely will do uh, a course just on psychology. And then tonight we're going to talk about the methodology, specifically stock selection. But the beauty of it is if you get better at any one of these, it strengthens that strand of the rope, okay? And then as that rope strengthens, the entire rope, so to speak, becomes even stronger. And this is where your success comes in. So the better your stock selection becomes with the methodology and being able to see the setups when they occur, see the good setups. And as I often preach, as they said in Market Wizards, intuition, which comes with a little experience, and not intuition, okay, trying to make something happen when nothing is there. Now, if you are in the best stocks, again, a good defense or sometimes your best defense is a good offense so if you're in the best stocks to begin with then you're going to be right more so your psychology is going to improve so not only did you get a little better with your methodology down here but the psychology is going to improve a little bit because it's going to put you in a better mood you're going to be able to to stay with those positions now staying with those positions means the money management improves and then you're taking some partial profits so you're following your money management plan so that strand begins to strengthen. So I just can't emphasize this enough. If you get better at any one aspect of trading, the other two aspects begin to fall in line and you become even better. And it kind of feeds upon itself. So get much better at your stock selection and then your psychological problems are all going to be reduced significantly. Now, you will have a good problem, okay? It's a champagne problem. Once you start getting big winners, then there's another psycho psychological problem dealing with that. But that's a good problem to have, okay? And I've talked about that quite a bit, too. People do have a hard time holding on to their big winners. We don't have enough time to get into that tonight, but that's a good problem to have. So uh, let's let's hope we have that problem. And you'll have that problem more if, as your stock selection increases. So, again, not to beat the dead horse, but as you get better with your stock selection, you're going to be better off. You're not going to be in a good mood and you'll be more likely to see the next opportunity when it occurs. And then you're going to be more likely to follow your plan. And this just feeds upon itself. So just get better at one and become more successful at all. And I think stock selection is a huge part of that. Now, you want to be become a detective and, and I call it a treasure hunt. Every night I'm sifting through thousands of stocks but it's a lot of fun for me because I know if I find that one or two that have the potential to make a big move, I'm going to make a lot of money. My clients are going to be happy with me, and they're going to make money, and then they're going to stay my clients. So for me, it's very exciting. Counterfeit to currency detectives, they don't learn their trade by looking at a bunch of crappy fake dollars. What they do is they spend their time studying the genuine article. Once they know what to look for, the fakes become pretty obvious and stand out like a sore thumb. So this line of reasoning also applies to life in general. So you want to study success, and you don't want to study failure. So again, if you want to be successful, study success. So I like to start most charts, most of these shows, by jumping into the charts as quickly as possible. I did want to build the base a little bit. So I've cherry-picked a few charts for you to study. Now, in this particular example, notice that this stock is gradually working its way higher. And you can draw a trend line underneath it. There's really nothing to do at this juncture, but then notice what happens. It begins to accelerate higher. And then not only does it accelerate higher, but it makes a nice higher move on a persistent type of move, okay? Uh, mathematically, this is known as linear regression if you draw the line through the bars. We're going to talk a lot about persistency tonight. And the more I teach and preach about persistency, the more excited I get about it because it's such an incredible concept when it comes to markets. And then we had a nice little TKO type of move, a little knockout type of setup that occurred. So this stock had a lot going for it. It had a nice gradual uptrend. It had an accelerating uptrend and, more importantly, a persistent uptrend this is a wonderful pattern to look for when you're trying to pick the best and leave the rest and a little tko move now this is what happened afterwards this is a little setup back here 
It didn't do a whole lot at first, but it's kept its head above its wa of the water, and then it just slowly worked its way higher. In fact, I'd almost prefer when a stock just kind of meanders and works its way higher kind of quietly as opposed to going straight up. Because if it goes straight up, it becomes what I call a bit of a bottle rocket. It just takes off like, and then it dies out and comes right back in. But sometimes when they have a slow start like this, it's a little bit more sustainable in their moves. Now, the stock might not look great over here, and it might not be set up for trading, but it looked great back here. And by the way, if you find a broker that lets you trade off the left side of the chart, let me know. But once you get into a trade, then you're into the unknown, and that's where following your plan comes in. But if you obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards, and you're picking the best stocks, it makes it much easier to follow your plan and not obsess. Now, here's another example, and this is an emerging trend. And this stock came down and made an all-time low, and it came down and skirted that low once again. So if you're familiar with classical technical analysis, you'll see a big picture double bottom. We don't rush out and trade a stock just because it makes a double bottom. But notice that it made a bow tie over here, and this is off of all-time lows. You can see it just kind of chopped around in here. There's no structure whatsoever, but the moving, and the moving averages are all over the place. But it came together right here. All the moving averages came together, formed a bow tie. Also notice that it began to accelerate higher it off, its, off its lows, and then it cleared all of this resistance. We'll talk a little bit about resistance in a second. And then it pulled back a little bit. Now, if you're familiar with classical technical analysis, and uh, more recent times, um, uh, a cup and handle pattern, saucer pattern has been around forever. And then uh, in more recent times, William O'Neill popularized the cup and handle pattern. But if you go back and read uh, Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee in all of these uh, books going way back in time, you'll see that they actually talked about these cup and these saucer patterns at low levels. So it's sort of like there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the markets and technical analysis. But anyway, you can see you have a nice persistent move. And this is where, uh, I, I, as I said earlier, every time I talk about persistency, it just seems I seem to see it more and more in the markets. And it's just a wonderful concept. So this is a very nice uh, setup here. Stock appears to have bottomed out. It cleared the resistance. And again, it pulls back a little bit. You got big picture patterns working and you got a nice little setup. And this is the move that it made out of that setup. So very, very impressive type of move. Again, this is a, another example of an inefficient stock, and we're going to talk about that in one second, but you can see that this is an IPO, and IPOs can be wonderfully inefficient, but once again, this shorter-term persistency pattern uh, shows up, and then you have an accelerated higher, a little bit of pullback, and again, it didn't take off in a crazy matter right away, but it did begin to accelerate higher, and even if you missed this original trade back here, you had a nice little pullback here, that looks great. By the way, all the, almost all the trades tonight or almost all the charts I'm showing tonight are actual trades or recommendations that I made in uh, the trading service ahead of time. So none of this is in hindsight, even though I did, quote, unquote, cherry pick a few for you. Uh, this is actually an open trade. Again, this is another IPO in VRO. And you can see it kind of worked its way higher. There's really not a whole lot to do just yet in this stock. But notice that it began to accelerate higher. And then again, there's that persistency pattern. And it pulls back a little bit, and you look to get long after that pullback. So far, so good. That one's worked out pretty nice for us. Here's yet another IPO that we are long. And again, notice that it kind of worked its way higher. There's really no trade back here. So you have to be patient. Sometimes you just have to wait, and you have to wait for the setup, knowing that you might get in a little later, but that's okay. And notice that, again, here's this persistency. In fact, as I'm speaking, once again, I'm seeing it even more clearly than I did before. So the more you look at the charts, the better you're going to get at this. And we have a nice little pullback in here. And once again, it didn't do a whole lot right away, but so far so good. And this stock is, um, has traded nicely higher. I think it's uh, nearly a double from that point. Um, we'll take a look at the portfolio in one second. Okay, I know uh, everybody can't stick around uh, for the entire thing. So if you're looking for the promo code uh, and you have to go, it's SSC300. And the course can be found on my website at this address, Stock Selection Course, or just simply go to Products and click on How to Pick the Best Stocks, Stock Selection Course. So, again, it's SSC, and it's all lowercase. So we'll come back to this towards the end of the webinar. Now, I want to 
talk about efficiency and more importantly, inefficiency. And all the stocks that we just looked at were very inefficient stocks. Now, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to efficiency, and I get all jazzed up. But I worry that it's a boring concept and that people might not be as excited as I am. But if you really study inefficient markets and even some inefficiencies in efficient markets, if you begin to study it and wrap your head around it, you can capture some wonderful moves. So making money is exciting. And although I'm a little nerdy when it comes to efficiency or inefficiencies, I should say, I think it's something that's worth uh, studying and studying well. In fact, I wrote an article on uh, inefficiency at, for our Traders Magazine, and, and I thought to myself, I said, they, they might not even accept this article because I'm worried it's going to be boring, even though I'm excited about it, right? Just because I'm excited doesn't mean it's excited for everyone. And uh, to my surprise, it actually became uh, their cover story. So the article made the cover of the magazine. So that was pretty exciting for me. So it made me realize how important it is. It also in my world travels, when I bump into uh, some of my peers, it's kind of cool when they'll start talking about inefficiency. It, make, it makes me realize that I'm actually on to something here. So let's talk a little bit about efficiency and inefficiency, more importantly. Efficient market hypothesis states that everything is priced into a market. So you are foolish to think that you could beat the market. And you know what? They're right to some extent when it, becomes, when it comes to very efficient stocks but their theory comes apart with less efficient stocks a solar stock with the promise of solving the world's energy crisis doubles over a few days a biotech with the promise of curing a hard disease makes some sort of similar type of move these markets are not efficient these large potential moves were not priced in it's kind of um it's kind of funny it's like the media has this uh, cycle they go through, or I'm not sure how everything happens, but we're all going to die of Ebola, uh, Ebola not that long ago, and then all of a sudden we completely forgot about Ebola, and guess what? Bam, Ebola's back in the news. So some biotech comes along with some sort of promise, and notice I said the word promise. Very important. When you're trading markets and you're trading inefficient markets, you're dealing off of a promise more than anything as opposed to reality. Once there is a reality with stocks, once there's a lot of earnings, or I should say uh, substantial earnings, and they have competitors, and the stock gets a certain size, then it becomes more efficient, and you are dealing with reality. Now, as far as inefficiency is concerned, it does not have to be some sort of new technological, easy for me to say, technological revelation that will solve the world's problems. It might be something like burritos or movie delivery or even comfortable yoga clothes for guys like Big Dave who eat too many burritos. So these smaller yet to be discovered companies are more efficient. So everything isn't priced in. If a market's efficient, everything is priced in, and you don't have that price disequilibrium. The market trades about where it should, okay? So how important is inefficiency? Well, this little stock we looked at earlier, which we had a nice little setup, it ran up 760% from its low. So that's how important inefficiency or finding these inefficient stocks is and that's the type of moves that are capable now let's sort of um define a little bit how inefficiency inefficiency works you can see that down here we have efficient stocks and then they become more inefficient as you move up. So, for instance, a large cap stock. So you've got some big, huge company, and there's hundreds of analysts analyzing it, and hundreds and hundreds of funds or thousands of funds own this company. And all these analysts tend to cancel each other out. All this trading tends to ca cancel each other out. Millions and millions and millions of shares are traded every day. But you get a little smaller company, then they're going to be very or much, 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 much more inefficient. Now, as they become 
discovered, more volume will flow in, and then the stock may make this big, huge, inefficient move. And then in time, keep in mind that it's a moving target. That stock will become more efficient in time. But we want to get in on that uh, inefficiency curve before that market becomes efficient, okay? Now, the more known a company is, the more efficient it's going to be. PepsiCo, for instance, is a lot more efficient than Sky People Fruit Juice, okay? Now, you don't want to rush out and trade some Sky People Fruit Juice just because it's inefficient. Obviously, you want some structure, and you want to see some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, or have already talked about, I should say, too, in the stock. Um, as a general rule, the lower the volatility of the stock, the more efficient it is. So if a stock's kind of bumping along and just kind of does this, then that's probably a pretty efficient stock. If a stock does make some nice, serious moves, then this stock is going to be more inefficient. So when I'm looking, when I'm culling through my database, looking for stocks to trade, I look at the higher volatility stocks first, and then I move down the line if I can't find anything and go to lower and lower volatility stocks. But you're going to have a much better opportunity in the more higher volatile stocks than in the lower ones because they're going to be more inefficient. Now, you might say, well, Dave, those are more, those are more dangerous to trade. Not really. Okay, if you have time, or if you don't have time, do it anyway. <laughs> go ahead and watch last week's Week of Charts, and we talked a lot about that. In fact, that's a, a topic that comes up quite often. You're much better off in these inefficient, more volatile stocks than these efficient ones because something bad could always happen in an efficient stock. It's, in fact, I have a strategy based on just that or something similar to that, in which I'll show you in just one second here. Now, if a company has fundamentals versus no fundamentals, then I, by fundamentals, I mean quantifiable fundamentals. I guess all companies have some sort of fundamentals. But it's kind of fascinating is Trill, T-R-I-L, which was a uh, – an IPO, I think it ran up about 100% a while back that we were we were long. We caught uh, we caught a pretty good bit of that ride higher, and we gave back a little bit, but we got stopped out at a nice profit. But I was doing a presentation. I think it was um, it might have been for I'm trying to think for who uh, it might have been for my trip to Italy. I think where I needed to uh, show some examples of inefficient stocks and to, to tie it into the fundamentals or lack thereof. Anyway, uh, I rarely do this, but on this particular case, I went to Yahoo Finance, and I looked up the company and to see what their fundamentals were, what their earnings were, and they actually lost $2.91. Now, we got in a trade around 15 or 60 bucks a share, if memory serves, and they lost $3 a share. That's a substantial, substantial amount of loss for a company. So if you have no fundamentals – then you're going to be more inefficient because the stock is going to trade on emotions alone, okay? So there's not a whole bunch of analysts fighting it out. Oh, it should make one penny more per share than its comp competitors or whatever. It's, it's kind of a big unknown, the big question mark on how to – what's a good word? How to quantify what the price should be. So it's going to be – very inefficient or more inefficient with less fundamentals. Now I could spend I could spend way more time on this <laughs> than that that you have and I have tonight because it's just something I'm very passionate about. But wrap your heads around um, efficiency and understanding it. So so what do you do with efficient stocks? Well, efficient stocks can make inefficient moves, and your best patterns for them and also for efficient markets like forex too, by the way is to look for them to make a major high and then look for some sort of sell pattern afterwards. In this particular case, notice that this is UAL. This is one that we're actually short right now. Notice that it made this big old base in here. Then it began to break down and pull back a little bit. This is a first pullback after a base breakdown. It's also what I call a first thrust type of pattern. If you put the moving averages in, you'll see that they crossed over too for uh, another signal here. Now, this isn't the most beautiful setup in the world, but remember, this is an efficient stock. So they can make one four opportunities on the short side. So, but don't just run out and blindly short them. If you go to my website under free reports, which is under uh, under the store or products, you'll see that uh, I have a report called the Go Go Nomo. So read that on shorting efficient stocks. So this would be an example of one. 
Now, as far as inefficiencies, IPOs are wonderfully inefficient. If you haven't picked up on that yet, um, if you don't, if you don't get any takeaway tonight other than persistency and acceleration higher, then know that IPOs are wonderfully inefficient. And when I did my IPO course, which is actually, uh, which was actually came out of my stock selection webinar. Um, the the thing about them was uh, it's the promise of the future. And again, there's no reality in most of these. I, I see posts all the time by people like holding themselves out to be uh, holier than now. And, and they, they, they do these blogs and they say, oh, 90% of these IPOs have no fundamentals. And it's like, you know what? That's exciting for me. That's great. I'm glad because they trade on emotions alone. And that's why when I did the course, I call them the promise of the future. There's no pesky fundamentals to uh, to muck things up, so to speak. Now, the other thing that makes it wonderfully inefficient is that you have people with a vested interest wanting them to succeed. Now, did I say manipulation? No, as Nicholas Fine would say. Of course not. Now, the other thing is they have no bad memories. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in just one second. Bad memories are people who buy in a range and let's say the stock drops and then when that stock tries to rally back up, it's going to hit this buying in here. And I'll talk quite a bit about that in just one second, if you could just stick with me. Uh, they trade, again, purely on emotions, which makes them a chart reader's dream. Now, here's a little inefficient. This is Solar City from a while back. This was in the trading service. Uh, nice little accelerating move higher. Nice persistent move higher. You get a little pullback in the IPO. And then it's off to the races. Not straight up, but it worked its way higher to double or triple over a, a fairly short period of time. Okay. So that's efficiency and inefficiency in a nutshell. Again, we could talk for a lot more on that. It's a very, very important concept. And if you if you follow me for any uh, period of time, I, uh, I will bring the topic up again and again. That I can promise. Now, since we don't, since we have limited time tonight, let's get into what you really need to look for and some of the things to avoid. Now, I don't know how many times I said persistency tonight, but I'm going to say it again. And again, mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. And the more webinars I do, the more seminars I do, the more courses I do, the more I realize how important persistency is. If you don't walk away with anything tonight, other than the fact that you need to seek out persistent markets to trade, then I think I've done my job here, and I think I just paid for your webinar, okay? So seek out inefficient markets, but certainly look for persistency. Now, again, I like to draw a trend line through as many bars as possible, and I think I have the pattern on my website. If I don't, just email me. I'll email it to you. A pattern I call persistent pullbacks, and all I'm looking for is a nice persistent move in the market and then looking for a pullback as my setup okay if you are new to trading or new earth to trading or if you're been around a little bit and you're having trouble trading i would recommend you just come back to this one pattern persistent pullbacks and only trade that one pattern until you get good at it the beauty of it is it's going to keep you on the right side of the market in 2008 and late 2007 i could not find any upside persistent pullbacks we were in the most uh, one of the most horrible bear markets in history but the beauty of it is if you were just trading this one pattern you probably would have beaten 95 percent of all money managers because you wouldn't have had any setups on the long side so persistency is vitally important here's a great example of persistency and once again too, keep an eye out or notice that you have acceleration higher too and notice that it tends to go up day after day after day after day. Nice persistent move higher in here. You got a little TKO type of move, a little acceleration higher. So that's what a nice persistent move looks like. And that's what a clean chart looks like also. And I'm going to talk about this in one second too. Never forget if you can draw a big arrow on your charts, it's probably in a trend. Now, this is what a bad stock looks like. It looks like electrocardiogram. And if you look at a chart and keep this electrocardiogram picture in your eyes, I'm sorry, in your mind's eye. And if you could hear beep, 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 it's probably 
a stock that you don't want to be trading. So let's look at what an actual electrocardiogram looks like. And you'd be surprised. I get charts like this all of the time. And people's like, hey, I'm thinking about buying this stock or selling this stock. It's like, well, wait a minute. What is your structure? This stock, and this is actually eBay, which is usually a very efficient stock. Okay. Notice it just goes up and down and up and down and all over the place. Okay. So you don't want to be trading a stock that looks like that. You want to go back and trade, or you want to go back in these slides. Oh, if you want the slides, by the way, you can have them. Um, and you want to trade those stocks that were in nice or that are in nice persistent trends, ideally accelerating trends, or an emerging trend off of major, major lows. Now, here's another biggie, and I see this all the time. When you're looking at a stock, a lot of times you'll kind of, in your mind's eye, draw this little dotted line, and you'll see it's up here, and it was down here. And you're like, oh, you know, Dave says draw a big arrow on the chart, so look, there it is, lo and behold. But it does take a little while to recognize this, and I'll show you something really simple that will help you in just one second if you hang in there. But you want to make sure that the trend is accelerating. So notice that this in this figure here, the market isn't very much higher than it was going back in time. So this is, again, notice that in all the charts I've drawn so far, I've showed you this accelerating pattern. And this is what I call the accelerating momentum strategy. And all you're looking for is a nice little move, a uh, nice move higher where stocks work its way higher. And then it begins to accelerate higher. And a TKO or a pullback can be a wonderful pattern to trade in these accelerating trends. Okay. Um, I see some some hands are raised. Just in the in the question box. Just if you have if you have questions, please ask. I'll be happy to answer them on the fly here. So again, just look at the market and ask yourself: Is it accelerating or is it decelerating? You want to avoid the markets are that are decelerating, even if they've made a substantial move higher and they appear to still be in a nice trend. Okay. Now it's I'm a little tongue in cheek with this, but on the back of my business card. I really do have these arrows drawn, uptrend, downtrend, and sideways. So if you ever get lost in the markets or you're trying to figure out what count, if it's a third or a fifth or a fifth of a third, or you're plotting that 15th oscillator or counting bars or something, and you're trying to figure out what that precise count is, just ask yourself, is it an uptrend, downtrend, or just plain sideways? And also... Go back to this figure here or think about this figure and ask yourself, is the trend accelerating or is the trend decelerating? OK. Now, here's a pattern that's very important to watch for. And there's several there's a, about a half a dozen more patterns. But if I had to just pick one to talk about tonight in the limited time frame, I would say it would probably be overhead supply. Now, keep in mind that everything I do has some sort of psychological backing to it. So when I'm talking about a chart pattern, there's a psychological reason for what the chart is doing. Ah, somebody just requested the report. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, I'm such a nerd. But I don't look at a chart and say, well, Venus is in line with whatever, or Mer Mercury just went retrograde or something like that. I can't even say it. But there's some sort of psychological reasoning or pattern behind it. So overhead supply is just plain old human nature. If people buy during a range, okay, and that stock drops below that range, because we know most people don't, most regular people, not you guys and girls here, most people don't have a plan in place. So they just kind of hang on forever. And if they ride that stock down, when that stock rallies back up, they're likely to get out when it hits that overhead resistance. A buddy of mine who's also a neighbor calls me up a couple years ago. Hey, Dave, I'm thinking about buying GE. It was about 18 bucks a share. I forget the exact numbers, but somewhere thereabouts. And I said, you know, I'm not so sure about this one because it looks like there was a lot of trading around 20 to 23. 
And I'd be afraid to buy it because it's not going to get past that level, or it's going to have a hard time, I should say, getting past that level. And then he said, oh, uh, uh, I bought it at 21. So it was just sort of a, a verification that technical analysis works because you're, you're, you're looking at the psychology of the participants and you're reading the mind of the market. So you might have the most beautiful setup in the world, but if there's a bunch of overhead supply right above the market, your gains are going to be limited to that level as a general statement. Now, there's, there's a lot to get into when it comes to overhead supply. There's the length of it. There's the width of it, like how much wide it is here, how far away, how far away it is from the market, and how far back in time. So there's quite a few factors to get into, which I did in the course. But here's your takeaway tonight. If there's a big, fat overhead supply, and it's pretty obvious then you probably want to avoid the trade. Now, this isn't a huge amount of overhead supply, but it's substantial. You got about a month to six weeks, maybe about uh, seven weeks of trading, where it traded between 10 and 11. And I saw this beautiful setup. It's a foreign stock, so it does chop around a little bit, but you kind of have to factor that into your uh, trading. I just kind of, with my mind's eye, I just kind of fill in the gaps because uh, the, it trades overseas. But notice it made a nice little bottom in here. It's probably also... A, uh, a bow tie, and then it made a nice thrust from lows, and then it pulled back. So it's just a beautiful setup. I saw this setup. I got all excited, and then it backed the chart out a little bit and says, whoa, wait a minute, Dave. It's gonna be, it might be capped. I don't know for a fact, but why would you buy a stock where you might be capped when you can maybe find one with no overhead, overhead supply, okay? Okay, good questions. Let's see. How do you define your edge? Markets are always changing. Well, markets are always changing, but trends will always exist. And the only way you can make money in a trade is to capture a trend. Okay, that's another speech. But if you buy at one level, you have to sell higher. So from there to there is a trend. So why not trade the trend all the time? Now, I tweak things a little bit over the years. In more recent times, I've become a little bit more liberal in my entries and you know what else my stock selection i become pickier and pickier and pickier and that's why i took 14 hours to do this course just on stock selection pick the best and leave the rest so that's what's changed as far as my edge you've got to be very careful you could you could program a wonderful a wonderful mechanical system that just prints money but guess what you go to use that system in a real market it's probably not going to work or not going to work for long because what you did was you've identified some sort of aberration in that market. Okay. Now, there are good times. There are bad times when it comes to trend following. When things get a little choppy, get a little iffy, you sit on your hands. That's why my last column, which I wrote way back last Wednesday, I think, I titled it Action with a question mark. Okay. Maybe now's the time we want to sit on our hands a little bit and make sure what we're seeing is really great. The more inefficient, the shorter term. Um, well, the more inefficient, the, the, the bigger the move the stock can make over a short term, if that's what you're asking, okay? I'm new to your methodology. To hear correctly that you are not looking for anything specific as far as fundamentals. I want to avoid all fundamentals, okay? And uh, Sean goes on to say, you're sticking to technical chart action only. That is correct. Technicals only. Because I think everything's reflected in the charts. Isn't it, if, once you start trading with the trend, not all the time, because sooner or later you will get whacked. That's one thing I can guarantee. But most of the time, you're going to find that surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. You go back to those IPOs we were just looking at. We had some nice gaps higher, at least in one of them. And that was because, guess what? They had some sort of news surprise that came out. So you're going to find that these quote unquote surprises tend to happen in a direction of trend. Did someone know that that news was going to come out and it was going to be good? I don't know. That that would be me saying it's manipulated, but the chart sure seemed to suggest that someone knew something. So your life's going to get a lot easier when you just forget totally about fundamentals. And I know it's hard because it makes so much sense. And you could sell a fund based on, oh, we're going to use technicals and fundamentals. 
Well, that sounds great on paper, but in theory, theory and practice are the same. In reality, they are not. So you're much better off just focusing mostly, I'm sorry, exclusively on the uh, technicals and avoiding the fundamentals altogether, okay? Visually look for no resistance above. Absolutely. When I do my scanning on my charts, and one day I'll see if I can record both screens at the same time. I think it would be kind of fun to do. But if you look at my desk, if uh, you have a chance, go in and watch the video I did on uh, stock, um, I'm sorry, on setting up your computers for trading. My main analysis, and this, this is a computer I'm working on now, I have some ancillary monitors over here with some other stuff going on. But my main analysis is done on these two monitors that I'm working off of now. And I have the short-term chart over here, okay? And then the longer-term chart is over here. Now, by longer term, these are both daily charts, okay? But I could see like about two to three years over here, and then I look at about, eh, about six months over here, okay? So if I see a setup, maybe like a deep pullback or something, it's like, oh, that looks kind of interesting. But if I look over here and I see a big wad of overhead supply just above the market, then I know it's probably not a trade I want to take. You want to set yourself up for success, okay? Would volume and price uh, chart help you to identify overhead supply? I don't use volume at all, but I have admittedly, you may have caught me, I have admittedly experimented with volume at price. And one thing that's cool about volume at price is if you do have a lot of trading at a level, you will have a big volume at price bar, okay? Stockcharts.com has volume at price if you want to experiment with that. So to answer your question, yes. Now, the reason I don't use it is because I've noticed that anytime I see a big wad of overhead resistance, I also notice there's a big volume at price bar. But yes, if you did have to use volume or did we force to use volume, if I was forced to use force to use volume, I would use volume at price. I think there's something there, but for me, it just identifies what's already in the chart to begin with. Now, I don't want to go into a rant about volume, but there's derivatives out there that could that could skew the volume. And there's volume that's not being reported properly. And then of course there's HFT, high frequency trading going on. So there's a lot of fun and games and crazy things that happen with vibes and I could actually make an argument um, both ways when it comes to volume but uh, not enough time to get into that tonight okay now one other concept and then I'm gonna get back to your questions but one other concept that I really want you to take home tonight too and this kind of goes back to the uh, acceleration versus deceleration of a chart it's the most simplest thing in the world. It's a net-net price change. Ask yourself, where's the price today, and where's the price going back in time, okay? A week, a month, or even longer. And you'd be surprised at how many people will say, hey, Dave, what do you think about this stock? It, it, it'll look like this. It's a pullback, right? Well, no, it's it, it hasn't done anything in two or three or four months. It's going completely sideways. Yeah, longer term from here to here, it might still be in a trend. And if you're long that stock, if you picked it up way back here and you had some little emerging trend pattern or a bow tie or something that we talked about earlier, then by all means, stay long that stock. Let the stop, S-T-O-P, take you out. But again, you want to look for perfection going in. So again, ask yourself, is it higher, unchanged, or lower than it was going back in time? And you'd be surprised at how many people – Again, we'll ask me about a stock that hasn't done anything in two or three months. So that's another one. Why does your approach work? Or are big players buying these stocks? If so, is your approach piggyback into the big players methodology? Well, I think what I'm doing is I'm getting in as the, I, I thought a lot about that recently. And, and that's the beauty of doing these webinars. And it just makes me think. Um, not that that's not all I think about as markets all the time, but it makes me think. And yes, we are we are getting in that that market, and we're riding that inefficient wave in those particular markets. Or on the downside, in something like UAL, we're riding that e efficient stock 
wave as that efficiency unwinds and inefficiency comes back in. Now keep in mind that efficiency, inefficiency kind of waxes and wanes. Okay, the, the little solar stock we looked at that was down at five bucks a share. At one point in time, that was 80 bucks a share. It was probably in a bunch of portfolios. It was tra probably trading millions of shares a day at that point. And they were starting to quantify it and do all these other things. And then it made an inefficient move to the downside. It became incredibly inefficient and they began to take off again. So, yeah, we're riding that wave. And ideally, the stock becomes uh, discovered as we're getting into it or after we're into it, obviously. But you don't know for a fact whether or not that's actually happened. And I've seen some methodologies that try to quantify, well, let's look at the institutional sponsorship. Let's look at this. Let's make sure this is – it's like you start putting all these layers on there and you forget to just look at the chart and ask yourself, is it going up, is it going down, or is it going sideways, okay? Okay, so the question is, what have you done for me lately, and what does proper stock selection look like? So this is the actual portfolio as of, I guess, Friday or as of Monday since the market was closed. And this is a snapshot that I took. Now, the second, this portfolio, just what we do is we divide the shares into a trending loaf and a trading loaf. And the, the, the idea is to capture an inefficient move in the markets. But we start out with a swing trade, and we hope that the second – half i know you're not supposed to hope in the markets but hopefully the second half will turn into a much bigger trade okay and this is our trending trade here the second uh, part of this now none of these have made extremely incredible gains but we've got some decent gains in here i'm not so worried about percent correct although at the time of this snapshot 10 out of 12 10 out of 11 of these were uh profitable in here so, I mean, that's great to be uh, a highly percent correct, but I'd rather make money than be correct, if that makes any sense there. The point is, uh, high, when you're highly accurate, it doesn't necessarily mean you're making money. If we were up a dollar on each one of these, then we could say, oh, well, we're 100% correct. Well, what good's a dollar going to do you? As soon as you get uh, whacked a little bit, that's all going to evaporate. So it's much more important to make money, and you make money by riding out these longer-term trends. How do you handle earnings announcements? I ignore all news. Write that down. Okay. I do not care about any earnings whatsoever. How much longer? I'm ready to fall asleep. What a dick. Well, thank you, Charles. <laughs> I guess I'm doing a good job. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, but here's the deal. It's not my way or the highway, you know. If you got something else you, you like to do, if this isn't exciting to you, then, uh, then geez, I don't know what what will be. I just showed you a stock up that went up 700%. Figure, that, figure out how to do that. You can make a lot of money. Then you could go to Vegas, and then you could have some excitement with that money. All right. I don't know how to kick people out, but uh, we'll have to kick Charles out. Obviously, he's not a fan. Oh, well, you know, can't make everybody happy. Okay. Uh, what's kind of cool here is that, now, this doesn't always work this great, so maybe I need to put that uh, dieters thing in here. Results, not typical. That's the first time I got called a dick in a presentation. <laughs> wow, that's a new one. Uh, anyway, back to the presentation. That's that's funny, though. Uh, so this is the portfolio. And, again, so – and that happened when the market went sideways like this. Now, sometimes, as I wrote a while back in the column, sometimes you're better off not knowing. So if you could go out and pick the best stocks, and a lot of those stocks were energy stocks, and um, we had some biotech stocks and some IPOs and all these wonderful inefficient stocks that made these substantial moves so far. And that was doing a trending market. So just think if we get a trend and keep this stock selection up. So this is what's got me really excited. Okay. I can't believe how lame this guy is. <laughs> uh it's shocking to be how stupid people could be, especially this guy. All right, Charles. Let me kick him out. Let's see how we kick him out. <laughs> well, at least you know he's not a shill. How's that? <laughs> okay.
a lot of questions coming in. Good, good questions. Okay, three, three to seven day uh, pullback, still the bread and butter setup. Uh, as a general statement, yes, but a lot of times your best setups or um, or uh, trend knockouts, which could, could happen in one day. Okay, so if you uh, just uh, get my slides after this, and I'll send them out when I send out the recording. And uh, look at like that CTLT and uh, what was the other one? CLDX, that was a TKO, okay? So uh, sometimes that happens in one day. But yeah, as a general statement, your pullbacks, two to, two to seven days, three to seven days can uh, work great, okay? We have been in an incredible market over the last several years. What's happened in the market... What happens when the market starts to transition? We start shorting, okay? Install, correct, and go into a bear market. Love your presentations. This guy who called you a dick is nuts. Thank you, Jeff. And my apologies to the ladies in here. I'm sorry. I just read the questions as I see them. Um, maybe I need to filter that out a little bit. Uh, but my apologies. Yeah, uh, go back and uh, if you want, you can download the service archives from 2007 because we started shorting in 2007 as, as the market rolled over. And we saw a few shorts setting up lately. We didn't take a whole lot of them. We just took the, uh, in fact, we just took one in more recent times, and that was a UAL. It helped us out a little bit today, but not much. But yeah, you'll start shorting. When the market begins to roll over, you start shorting, okay? And, and I did a presentation last week in the week of charts on shorting. And uh, just in case, it's like hopefully it wasn't the harbinger of things to come. But I did that presentation, and I don't like to short. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do because there are some issues when it comes to shorting, but these same, pa these same patterns work on the short side, and especially like your bow ties and your first thrust and patterns like that, because they slide much faster than the guide, okay? Let's see. <laughs> Charles. Let's see if we can, uh, we can get rid of him. Let's dismiss Charles. Charles has been dismissed. All right. <laughs> You know, it's like, where? how could you be so malignant? It's like I'm trying to give out some good information. You know, yeah, there's a, there's more. Uh, you could, uh, I have something to sell here, but I'm giving you good stuff. His poor wife. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. I bet he's, uh, now that I dismissed him, he's probably going to go outside and start yelling at the neighbor's kids. <laughs> Get out of my yard. All right. Uh, first of all, we start off with all stocks. And this is the treasure hunt I go on every night. And what I do is I create a tradable universe, and that's of uh, stocks that are or, um, 250K or more as a general statement over the past 30 days of volume. And I'm looking for – I'm not worried about what they're doing with the volume itself. I'm more interested in uh, having a stock that's liquid enough to trade. Okay? So – that creates my tradable universe. And then I create a first call. Now, somebody's asking me about new highs. Yes, I run a, a new high scan first. And that tells me two things. That tells me, one, where the money's flowing in the market, or like a day like today where there are none, that nobody's flowing into the market, and maybe I'm, I need to be a little cautious. But, um, again, it also tells – what's the second thing? I guess it tells me the health of the market, where the money's flowing in the health of the market. So on a day like today, it's like, uh-oh. We're not seeing a whole lot of new highs. Market might be in a little bit of trouble, but let's not get too excited just yet. Let's honor our stops just in case, and let's wait it out. Okay. So I will create what I call the Landry 100, which is 100 of, of momentum stocks. And my only rule for that, the main rule for that is it has to make a new high on an expansion of range. Okay. So I'm not necessarily trading this Landry 100, although I do, although I do track it on a daily basis. And it absolutely prints money when the market is trending, and when market is not, it doesn't do so well. Also, it tends to get whacked right before the market sells off hard, so it's kind of a fascinating um, thing to look at, okay? Uh, so I go through a first call pretty quick when going through Tradable Universe, and then um, obviously I take a look at the, the IPOs. And then from all this, I make my Landry list, which is a list of uh, stocks that I might want to trade. And then I decide from those whether or not I want to actually take some action in the overall market. Okay. All right. Let's take some questions. Lots of questions. All right. Let's see. How does it? How long does it take you to scan the market on a daily basis for potential trades? A couple hours. Do you recommend we learn to do that? Yes. Or should we use your service 
uh, for potential candidates. Uh, Jeff, I would do both. My best clients are those who do their own homework and who also um, who also uh, follow along too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for defending Charles. Let's not talk about him anymore. Uh, okay. Okay. Is it, that's the first, uh, that's the first heckler I've ever had. That's, that's kind of, that's exciting. I mean, <laughs> wow. Uh, what are your thoughts on Facebook? Well, um, email me on that or come to the chart show on Thursday. We'll talk about individual sort charts, uh, uh, then, okay. Okay, so Joe's asking about new highs. Yeah, new highs make a wonderful candidates for future stocks, and that's why I track them in the momentum list, okay? What moving average is using the bow tie? 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential, okay? How far back do you look for overhead resistance before you would discount it? That's a little bit more, that's a detailed answer. It's kind of like I know it when I see it, but uh, there's a lot more to it in the, um, in the course, okay? Maybe you were called a dick because you're a great detective. Hey, I like that, Rick. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> well, at least it's not too boring tonight, huh? Okay, uh, let me just mention the course here and uh, give you the code again, and then uh, we'll answer the rest of those questions. Uh, again, like some of these questions, we'll take time to explain about like overhead resistance. We spend quite a bit of time on that. I have uh, some more ways to determine uh, inefficiency. Speaking of becoming a better detective, uh, what I actually do is I walk through, and we did this over a period of weeks too, and it's all recorded. I did 14 hours total where I actually go through the chart, show you what I like, show you what I don't, and uh, show you what I actually picked. And if you look on that stock selection course page, those are the actual stocks that I picked when I did the webinar. And you can see exactly what they did or did not do. And most of them went up nicely, knock on wood, okay? Anyway, you can read the rest of this. There's quite a few other things um, that I'm doing. And... Uh, I did cover IPOs, and this is, was the genesis of my IPO course. So if you do get this course, uh, just let me know. Just say, hey, Dave, hook me up, and then I'll give you 50% off of the IPO course, okay? What everything I do course-wise is 100% money-back guarantee and unlimited lifetime support, okay? So unlimited lifetime support means that if you have a question about a stock, picking about stock picking I will answer that question that doesn't mean you can call me up and say hey Dave I got a system can you help me work on it that's a different type of support that's a support that I really don't want to get into because I spent 20 something years working on my own methodology and that's what I have learned to uh, wrap my head around it's what I enjoy doing it's what I want to do in the markets I'm not interested in changing styles okay not that I don't pay attention to what's going on but I think that my methodology is the best thing I found after many years of searching. So 100% money back guarantee, zero risk on that. Um, I don't think I'll even see the refund. That'll just go through and I won't even know about it. So somebody was asking if I, you know, if I would say something about a refund. No, absolutely not. I, I'm not going to even bother with that. Um, and then again, unlimited lifetime support. Now keep in mind that unlimited lifetime support also means that you ask me a question and I might put you back to work. Okay. So let me just put that promo code up again and answer some of these questions. Uh, scan by relative straight to find the best way to find stocks. No, uh, it's it's wonderfully useful. OK, uh, I used to do a lot of relative straight scans, but now I find that I just prefer looking at a lot of stocks, looking at uh, most of the stocks of a tradable universe, sort of by volatility. When the volatility uh, basis using HV gets below a certain level, I tend to um, – go quicker and not pay as much attention to those stocks because I know that those stocks are going to be probably more efficient, like we just talked about a few minutes ago. But uh, I prefer uh, to just to look look at a lot of stocks versus doing the uh, uh, scans, okay? Do I use a rules-based approach along the lines of uh, my edge or more discretionary? Uh, both, Okay. If I see a stock that's in a nice persistent trend, it's a nice accelerating trend, it has a knockout type of move, then I'm all over it. I'm all excited about it. It's almost like a mechanical type of trade. My stop, my entry is going in right above the high. My stop is going in right above the low. And I'll actually take that on a more mechanical basis. Um, but, yeah, there is it is a discretionary method as far as what I'm doing. And, obviously, uh, there's, there's only a few patterns that are a little bit more mechanical. Some of the IPO stuff – 
I actually, I, I hate to use the word close my eyes, the phrase close my eyes, but I do trade that a little bit more mechanically. But most of what I do is uh, is the uh, discretionary method. And uh, But the good news is if you look at charts long enough, these patterns should begin to jump out at you, okay? You're welcome, Avinash. Thank you so much. Okay, no, Jeff, you might be seeing an aberration. Jeff says it appears you trade a lot of stocks with price less than ten dollars a share. Are these stocks more risky to trade? As a general statement, they're probably more risky to trade on a volatility basis. But like I said earlier, with volatility comes opportunity, and it's better the devil you know. I'd rather trade a more volatile stock than a less one. Now, the only reason you're seeing those stocks less than ten dollars a share is because the energies have gotten really beaten up over the last few years. The metals have gotten really beaten up over the last few years. And then what was giving us opportunities? While this market is just a big fat blue, a big blue arrow going absolutely sideways, what do we have? We had energy stocks setting up. We had metal setting up. And these stocks are just these really low levels. Years ago, I tended to trade mostly higher price stocks because I was a little bit more short-term oriented, a little bit more worried about a point-based move versus um, – just a move in general. Now I just want to capture a move. And, and I guess you, if you boiled it down, I'm trying to capture as big a percent of move as possible. Okay. Are you going to post this to YouTube? Yes, Heather. Um, except for the, uh, we might have to beep out the foul language. <laughs> Maybe he was calling me a detective, you know? Maybe that's right, huh? Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. How do you hang on a stock that uh, will that hit your stop and keep going sideways? How long do you hang on a stock that will hit you? Uh, forever. Forever. Uh, if you go into my YouTube channel, you're going to see that I do a dead money report every time one presents itself. And my dead money reports, and I wonder if I could pull up one real quick and show you what that looks like. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, here's one. I'm just randomly picking one off my computer. Uh, and this is what a, a stock looks like, okay? That's dead money. So notice that uh, we got in this one, and our actual entry was back here. Um, oops, not going to let me do it. But you can see that it just went sideways forever, and then it finally took off, and it went up about 20% in about uh, oh, a month and change. But that's 113% annualized, and in this particular case, it was still counting. So I will stay with a stock until stopped out. It's very hard for many people to do that, but sometimes you have to be patient. Thank you, Frank. Great effort. Appreciate the effort. Great job. Thank you, Barry. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, the call list, Joe, it, it takes a while to go through the, uh, the complete call, and I did that in, 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 the, uh, in the stock selection webinar where uh, the course where I go through I start with the entire database I create the tradable uh, universe and then from that we start whittling it down uh, picking out some momentum stocks looking for some either trend transitions or whatever the market is offering or some persistent moves uh, a day like today it would have been pretty boring because everything is just kind of chopping around and some of the stocks at high levels have come back in and they're not really set up just yet. So, and then the battles of mining kind of rolled over a little bit. So did the energies. So we're not seeing any, or I should say, many setups there. So now might be the time to sit on our hands. But yeah, you start with the, like like I said, in the stock uh, funnel, you start with the top of the funnel with all the stocks in the world, or at least all of the United States, and then you work your way down. George says, how much weight do you give geographical events such as Greece? with respect to U.S. indices, uh, none, zero, absolutely none. We're actually long Greece right now because we had a setup. Now, today wasn't such a good day for Greece, but let's just see what happens tomorrow. And if we get stopped out, we get stopped out. Like I said uh, last week in the webinars, when you see a chance, you take it. You see a wonderful opportunity, then you just go out and take it, knowing that there's a chance that you might be wrong. But, no, I do not worry about what's going on overseas. Uh, I still think the dog wags the tail instead of the tail wagging the dog. But uh, eventually that might not be the case. Uh, China might become the next big superpower. Uh, but I'm still going to trade U.S. stocks. And uh, maybe I'll just trade more Chinese stocks then too. Whatever market is moving is the market that I'm going to be trading. But right now I seem to find enough opportunities within the United States. Okay. You're welcome, Kevin. You're welcome, Joe.
Have you ever annualized how much the potential profit methodology captures? Well, I look at individual trades sometimes and annualize them out. Uh, do you typically get 50% of a move or what? How much meat do you capture? It depends, uh, Jeff, the, the amount of meat you capture uh, on a trade. And see, that's where that's where like that mechanical system testing comes in, which is great in theory, but not so much on paper because mechanical system testing will say, well, you, you should only give up so much of your move because uh, every time in the past you've given up more than that, you really didn't make any money on a trade. Well, as soon as you start trying to quantify all that stuff, that's when you're going to miss that 800% move in a little solar stock or a biotech stock. So stay with the stock until stopped out, and you have to be willing to give up some of the trend. I talk a lot about uh, money and position management. So uh, take a look. And, and a lot of this stuff is just out there free on YouTube, okay? Uh, go out there and watch some of the things I talk about money position management, about staying with trends, giving up a little bit of the trend in the end, and a little bit of dead money. Ron says, super presentation. You know your stuff. Your critic is a fool. That's okay. I mean, I'm there. it's fun to have a critic. <laughs> you ever trade credit spreads? No. No. Uh, you're talking about like a, just a plain old option credit spread? I I'm not a big fan. There's too many moving parts when it comes to options. And I prefer to just keep it simple. Maybe every now and then I'll do some outright options. But options, you got to get the time right and you got to get the price right and the magnitude. Not only the price right, you got to get the magnitude of the price right. And nobody is that right as a general statement, okay? Arsene says, I always learn something important in your webinars. Thanks to the effort you put in. I really appreciate it. Okay, well, good. Well, see, now people won't think I have shills in here. <laughs> now that a critic, okay? Okay, any more questions? You're welcome, George. So, again, check out the webinar, 100% money-back guarantee, lifetime support. I stand behind everything I do. Uh, I answer my own phones, so you can call me here. I will answer the phone. Uh, sometimes I get a little busy, so you just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, that next phone call is going to be me, and I'll pick up the phone. Okay? Any more questions? Love the rope analogy. Oh, thank you. That you presented at the beginning of the presentation. Absolutely, Jeff. Okay, any more questions? When will the recording be available? I'll start processing it and downloading it um, tonight, and then tomorrow I'll send out the, the recording. But if you keep an eye on my YouTube channel, uh, it's www.youtube.com slash C as in custom slash Dave Landry. And uh, you'll subscribe to the channel. And, you know, you won't get any emails or anything off of that. It's just when you log the email, log it to uh, YouTube, you'll see the video. So I'll, I'll try to get it up uh, tonight. It'll take a few hours of process. Uh, but I will send it out uh, tomorrow with the actual slides. Uh, if you guys want the slides, I'll send those out too. Okay, any more questions? Going once, going twice. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm, I'm flattered by your presence. presence. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, everyone have a fantastic night. And uh, Weekend Charts is on Thursday. So if you have any follow-up questions or questions in general, because we had some really good questions tonight, and I wish I could have gotten to all of them. But uh, bring those to Thursday's show, and I'll be happy to talk about them. Okay, everybody have a fantastic night, and thanks again.